Good morning to you all. My name is Anand Lokhande. Welcome uh, to the PMI National Conference being held for the first time in Bangalore. I'm sure most of you would have attended the practitioners conference in the previous years. If not, for the first timers, a warm, warm, warm welcome again. Uh, during the auspicious uh, festival season of Ganpati, uh, I'm sure we will have a great start uh, to the conference as well. Uh, and special welcome to the special session today. My host uh, for the morning is Mr. K. Raghunath. He is the Vice President uh, for Education and Training Programs in the PMI Chapter Bangalore. I will now hand over to him to invite uh, Mr. Kedar Fadke. Let me also... Uh, a uh, round of applause for Kedar Fadke, the speaker of the morning. <laughs> Kedar Fadke is Vice President of Fadke Associates, a global consultancy and software company specializing in statistical tools for improving testing and design productivity. Kedar has led numerous deployments for improving test and design effectiveness in the financial services, IT, high-tech, and defense industries. He is the author of several articles and papers on the benefits of utilizing orthogonal rays for software and system testing. Kedar has a MS in Statistics, MS in Management, and a BS in Economics from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. And with that, my friends, I hand over to Kedar Fadke. Have an enjoyable session. It's a, going to be a long session along with your machines as well. So uh, have patience and uh, a quick uh, housekeeping call. Mobile phones on the silent. If possible, switch off. Uh, if you need some power access, there is a power access on the lines of the wall. But make sure you know, you're not disturbing the others. And uh, I would say enjoy the session again. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be talking to you about orthogonal rays. Anand, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks to PMI for, uh, for inviting me to come and present about orthogonal rays. I think uh, orthogonal rays are applicable in various industries for both the design and testing. I'm going to focus in the area of testing. And I think it's very fitting for the current theme of nation building. One of the keys in building a strong nation is not just thinking about what can bring your company more profitability but also looking at what can increase productivity of your people as a, as a nation. And orthogonal rays is one of the tools. There are several tools available. Orthogonal rays is one of the methods you can use to increase productivity of Indian staff to promote productivity for many years going forward. Now, just a quick uh, housekeeping. Uh, if people have questions during the uh, presentation, please just stand up and shout them out. Um, I'll answer them on the spot. If uh, they seem uh, like they're going to take some time, then I'll say, okay, maybe we'll uh, discuss during a break. But otherwise, please uh, keep, keep, keep the session interactive. Now, just to get a quick show of hands, how many people here have heard of orthogonal rays before, before signing up for this session? Okay. Good. How many people have used orthogonal rays in testing? Okay. All right, very good. We have a, we have a whole new group uh, to work with. Uh, so very quickly, uh, just to go over some, uh, uh, a, a basic introduction. Uh, first, I'm just going to talk about what is the challenge in testing? I know some of you may have testing backgrounds. Uh, all of you have project management backgrounds which means everybody has some sort of testing in their work. Either their staff are doing it or they're doing it personally. So what's the challenge in testing? And how does that relate to project management? Thank you. Well, here's a quote from the Assistant Secretary of Defense of the United States. Uh, the United States, as you know, spends hundreds of billions of dollars a year on testing their defense systems. Hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And this is his quote. He's the chief buyer of the entire government military. He said, half of the systems are not operationally suitable. That means half the systems that have gone through years and years of developmental, operational testing, end user testing, they can't put them in the field. They don't trust them. Hey, there's, there's a tremendous opportunity for improvement. 
Here's a Gartner study uh, from about two years ago. Half projects have 50% or greater cost overruns. I'm sorry, 40% over cost overruns. 60% of projects are three months or greater late. And this was a study that focused on financial services firms within uh, India, actually. So what it says is there's a tremendous opportunity to affect cost and schedule and still deliver performance. There, there's, there's huge opportunities to improve testing. And just to give you a few more, uh, a better idea of the challenge in testing, here's some notable test failures. These are very well-respected companies, BlackBerry, uh, the Federal Aviation Agency, the United States. They had major field failures. These aren't failures at the end of product integration or pre-release. These are failures during release that actually cause downtime to customers. And the cost of these are insurmountable. The FAA, they had to cancel flights, a uh, tremendous number of flights, and had to reset their system, had their databases all cleared, lost a lot of flight logs. It was a disaster. So it says, the current state of testing needs improvement. So what, 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 is, what is the technical and business challenge? And I think these are all project management challenges. The first is, how can you reduce test cost and schedule? All of us have a cost goal. All of us have a schedule goal. So how can we meet that effectively? Our systems are very complex. So how can we intelligently plan our test cases to meet cost and schedule? But there's something even more important. We're not just looking at test efficiency. I could, I could uh, create efficiency right now. Someone gives me a 100 case test plan. I say, I want efficiency. I'll only run one test case. But then there's no effectiveness. You get no product assurance. So also, along with getting efficiency, which is reducing cost and schedule, we want to get assurance that our system works. When we run our tests, we want confidence that if these tests pass, it's going to work flawlessly in the field. And, and vice versa, we want to say, if we, if we run these tests and we uh, see failures, we want to be able to find them very quickly. So if there are failures, we want to find them. If there's no failures, we want to prove there's no failures and move forward. Effectiveness. Also, requirements change all the time. And this is a nightmare for testers, project managers, everyone. How can you update your test plans, plans rapidly to meet the changing world? Everyone's requirements evolve because the customer changes his uh, idea of what he wants. And also because our understanding of requirements change. The environments may change. Our platforms that we run our systems on may change. So we have to change. And finally, and this is, I think, the most important for a uh, project management group, ensure consistency across an organization of testing. In most organizations, testing is dependent on the individual. One individual do a fantastic job on certain modules. Another individual do another fantastic job on other modules. But we may have a few gurus that can do an excellent job, but oh, we have thousands of people in our companies. How can we get consistent test performance across our industry? And the answer is, use orthogonal arrays. And I'm going to walk through not only the full orthogonal array process, but also examples that touch upon each of these uh, in various industries. I'm going to talk about examples from the defense industry, from the IT industry, financial services industry, as well as a telecommunications industry. And kind of as a fun starter exercise. I, I thought it'd be great to first establish what is the testing challenge? I know some of you, how, how many here have testing backgrounds, have worked as testers or are currently testers? Okay, so maybe about, right, about 50%, they're slowly raising their hands. It's not embarrassing, I worked as a tester too, so not a problem. How many uh, of you manage a group of testers or manage testing? Okay, all of you. That's, that's, that's great. Um, so what we're going to do here, and I know, how, and how many of you installed the training simulation software, just to get a, okay, so, so a few of you. So for, for those of you that didn't, we're going to do this by hand. Uh, for those of you that uh, have the training simulation software, we, we can move on to execution later on, and, and we, we can work with both of those groups. Uh, so uh, in this challenge, what we're going to do is ascertain what is the testing challenge. And take a real simple problem. We're going to use a browser uh, compatibility test. Um, this was actually a real case study, simplified, of course, uh, for one of the biggest retailers in the United States, an online retailer. Uh, they were launching a major upgrade to their website. And uh, the upgrade was to include, uh, this was a couple years ago, 
to include video and audio um, on their product pages. So they uh, wanted to make sure that these new pages worked with all their various customers. And you can just imagine how many different customers you have. Customers have different operating systems. Customers have different resolutions. Um, they may be viewing different types of pages. You know, some have video, some have audio, some have both. Um, they may be uh, having certain plugins. Maybe they don't have certain plugins. It, the, the, the number of combinations is tremendous. It's a very simple problem if you think about it. Everyone's gone to a website. But from a system designer standpoint, to validate that all your potential customers uh, can access the site and get a good performance is a challenge. And this is just the background here. So, and flawless launch is critical. If you talk about uh, these online systems, let's say your page doesn't load properly. What does a customer do? They go to a new page. They're not going to wait around for you. If it doesn't look right, they're going to say, I'm not going to buy this product. So you lose customers if, if your product doesn't launch properly. And you, so you want to get thorough testing. Now in this case, the test budget that your boss has set is 40 test cases. So you can create 40 trial clients to access these different pages. And of course, every, every system has a budget. Uh, you guys are project managers. You set a budget. You have a set of requirements. And you say, how can I meet this most effectively? So here are the requirements. And of course, these are simplified from the real requirements. The website utilizes three templates. There, there was actually about 50 templates, but we'll, we'll stick to three here. Uh, template one was text only, was the old style templates for old products. Template two included audio, so there was some kind of audio recording that gave a description of the product. And template three included video, so it included video clips. So these were the three different types of templates. There were many different operating systems. Now I said this was a couple years ago, so people were still using Windows NT. Now I don't think that's uh, being used as much. So Windows NT, Windows ME, Windows 2000, XP, et cetera, different Mac OSs as well. So there's several different operating systems that can be used. Customers may have different browsers. And since this was a few years ago, there's no Chrome. Of course, if they were testing today, they'd have Chrome in here also. Um, customers may have different display resolutions. And customers may have or not have certain plugins. And under all these cases, they want to make sure that their clients get a good uh, performance from their system. So here's my challenge to you. Just take a few minutes on a piece of paper, pretty simple requirements. And by the way, you have these in your booklet, so you don't have to look on the screen, uh, the requirements. Hey, create a test plan. And I know we're giving a short time here uh, due to the time constraints, but hey, do the best you can do. And use your current practice. If you're not a tester, use the current practice you assume your testers use. Or if you don't know what your testers do, just make it up. Uh, but, but the key is, use what you feel is the right way to test the system. You have a max of 40 tests. And don't worry about this hand in part. Uh, There's too many people here. And let me show you a simple format you can use. And for those of you that have computers, uh, you can put it in Excel if you want. Uh, I'm more of a uh, writing on paper person. But essentially what you want to do is hey, just list, OK, take test number one, test number two, test number three, make a row for each test case and write what the settings are. Okay, what template do you want to test? What operating system? What Firefox? So these are your trial clients that are going to go and access a particular template. Does anyone have any questions? What, what I'm asking here to do is just take, take a minute to think about it. It's a very simple testing problem from a conceptual standpoint. You have a limit of 40 tests. There's way more than 40 all combinations. No one can afford to create hey, thousands of clients to test with. So how would you select your clients with, with a budget limit of 40 in order to assure that this page is going to load properly? OK, so everyone just take, uh, let's, let's take 15 minutes. It's 10.43 right now. And I'll walk around and help people also if you have any questions. Or, or you can just call out questions. And just note down on a piece of paper as many as you can. And if you think about it, this is very analogous to the
the kind of project management challenges we face today. We have really large, complex problems. We have strict budget limits. And in this case, we have a strict schedule limit, only 15 minutes. Yeah. Here, here's a page with the requirements, by the way. So you can refer up here as well. Yeah, yeah I, th I think there was a really good question here. Uh, someone said, you know, the total permutations and combinations is really high. 972, it's actually a little higher than that, but we, we can go. But it, it's, it's, it's in the th three, about 3,888. Um, but the limit is 40. Hey, that's reality. All of your systems. I don't, I've never seen, a, I, I, I've seen, I've gone to some companies and they say, we test all combinations. I've never seen a company that really tests all combinations as profitable. You can't do it. Unless you're working on such a simple system, in which case, hey, you, no optimization needed. That's what we're going to learn. <laughs> I think there was one more question just to clarify. Keep this, this as the test scope. I know there's new operating systems like Windows 7 and, and such, but assume this is your test scope for now. Yeah. OK, I, th I think uh, this is a good point to stop uh, wherever you are. If you haven't finished your 40 or however many you choose, uh, I think, it's, uh, I, I think uh, let's, ha let's have a quick discussion here. So what type of strategies did people use? I, I know one person here. Do you want to explain the strategy you used? Yeah, go ahead. So what I, what I did was, what was that into a unique combination. Let's say, for example, I took parameters. Oh, sorry. I took different parameters. Let's say template, OS, browser, display, and the plugins. And for each parameters, I identified how much values it can come. Yeah. Let's say, for example, templates 3, 9. Then I put and multiplied and arrived at the 3888. Okay. Now, it's very hard for the given budget, and we cannot, first of all, create 3,888 test cases. We need to identify what is the logical thing that I need to do so that I cover um, based on my budget and the time. So then I want to do reduction. First, we arrive at the maximum values. Then we'll apply reduction strategy. So for this, what we normally do is we identify what is the bare minimal uh, test we have to do so that it covers all scenarios. The one I tried here was I applied first to test the plugins. Okay, once plugins works on one type of browser, it is expected that plugins work the same way in other browser. Okay, okay. then if I finish off the plugin test, let's say resolution. Resolution, I did one one test for the resolution. So okay. like that, I did the approach and I, for me some thirty test cases came. Okay, that's 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 good. So he used some. Expert judgment. So he said, okay, looking at these, I'm going to make some judgment and say, okay, maybe I don't have to run tests on every single browser with every plugin. And then he went through every requirement. I think he used more of a traditional requirements traceability test plan, which is, okay, make sure there's a test for each template. Make sure there's one test for each uh, operating system, one test for each of these, one unique test for each. Did anyone else follow that approach? So requirements traceability approach. It's used, it's used quite often. It's a it's, a, it's one of the standard approaches. Are there any other approaches people used? Yeah, go ahead. Can someone give a mic? Yeah. Hi, my approach uh, will be, I will try to use risk-based testing here. Uh, uh, we'll try to use the web analytics report, like especially on this scenario, that uh, how many operating systems are used so we'll see like 90% of my population is using yeah. Windows XP yeah. and just 10% is using. Okay. So on the basis of that, I will prioritize my test cases and uh, then we'll... Uh, okay. That's, that's a very test. good approach. So you're saying, uh, let's say 90% of people use Windows XP. Yeah. Just assume that. So you'll say, okay, I'm going to make sure I run a lot of Windows XP test cases. And then uh, let's say 90% of people use IE also, IE. just because they use Windows XP. Okay, I'll keep... Uh, majority of my browser tests and IE. That's, that's a good approach also. So, so it's using research um, uh, and understanding of, of your users and prioritizing your test cases based on that. That's, that's another very popular approach. Any, any other approaches that were used? Anybody just randomly pick tests? No? Some people do that. It's a good approach. It works sometimes very well. Ra random tests. Yeah, go ahead. I, uh, I thought uh, let's 
template 3, template 1 and template 2 as a subset of template 3 because both template 1 is only text, template 2 is uh, audio, template 3 is video. So I, th I thought template 3 as a subset of template 1 and template 2, right for template 3. That should cover for both template 1 and template 2. Okay. That's, that's, that's another approach. Now, now here's the question. Oh, go ahead. One more. Um, hi. Um, another idea which probably occurred as uh, we are discussing this is probably to look at the operating system which is the oldest amongst this probably NT and take the latest amongst that and make sure it works on both of them and likewise on the resolution which is the lowest and then the highest. Even though it won't be, I mean, uh, cent per cent, but uh, you can get, get, get a fair idea that it's working on the oldest and the latest. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's, that's a very good approach. So again, you're saying use knowledge of the domain. Use knowledge of this, uh, let's say you're an expert at uh, web development. You say new, use knowledge of the domain and reduce the number of factors is what you're doing. You're saying um, because, I'm, let's say I use Windows NT and I pick, let's say, Mac OS X, oldest and newest. Let's just assume those are the oldest and newest. Say, okay. I can eliminate the other ones because I'm spanning the whole domain. Like equivalence classes type of, type of uh, philosophy. Yeah, that's, that's also a good approach. Now, we look around the room. I think there's about 70, 80 people here. And I assure you, we got about 70 or 80 different test plans. So it took, everyone got the same problem, got different test plans. Now, that's one of the questions. When you're managing a project, how do you manage it when every single individual is going to generate test cases separately? Even if they use the same uh, philosophy, they may come up with separate test cases. For example, a gentleman over here created 29 requirements traceability test cases. You could do tw uh, requirements traceability in a little bit shorter than that, actually, if you really wanted to do them independently, because some of the test cases are common. So someone might have a separate test plan than you. Someone may think that when they're interpreting this, and this, by the way, is a slight trick, because not all requirements are written so clearly, customers may have Java, Shockwave, Flash, and WMA, it doesn't mean they're exclusive of each other. You could have yes or no of each of these. So, so the folks that were saying that there were 972, I think, total combinations, were missing each of those could be a yes or a no. Because you could have all four plugins, you could have no plugins, or you could have a combination in between. Which is why total combinations comes to 3888. So maybe someone will interpret it differently and think, okay, uh, you, each of these plugins are exclusive because the way they interpret the requirements document, if requirements are not written clearly. So just to get a sign of hands, who, who would bet their next week's salary that if I ran their test case, the website would work? Anyone? No. I, I, if I wrote it manually, I probably wouldn't either. So. <laughs> So I, I think the next step was we were actually going to execute these test cases um, uh, using the simulator, but it looks like very few of you have, have the uh, software loaded, so I think we'll skip that for now and, and move on. Just let, let's take this lesson that if you look across an organization or you look across this room, every person comes up with different test scenarios to the same problem. So the expectation of a project manager that when they hand someone a set of requirements and say test to these requirements, that they're going to get high quality from every single individual is not correct. There's variability across an organization. And the other thing, lesson to take is, take a very simple problem like this. It's pretty complicated to generate test cases within a budget. If I told you you have unlimited money, unlimited time, everyone would just test all combinations. But that's not reality. So how can we efficiently generate test cases that give us high coverage, that tell us, OK, we're going to find defects, if there are defects, or we're going to prove there's no defects. And the second question is, how do you get consistency across your organization? So if you hand a test plan to this guy, this guy, that lady over there, you're sure that you're going to get high quality coming out. Now, these are things that will really benefit an organization. I, I think one, one more challenge uh, to think about is, you planned your test cases. Someone's going to execute them. Maybe you're the tester, you execute them. Is your job done as a tester? No, you have to say, what's the cause of this defect? You have to say, oh, it's due to this browser, or it's due to this resolution and this browser, or it's due to this template and this plugin. How easy is data analysis? 
generally, it takes a significant number of additional tests. So someone on the back end, a developer is going to take these test reports and run more tests. to Say, OK, I want to narrow down. Is it due to this factor or this factor or a combination of these factors? So you're going to be way over your budget of 40 tests. So we're also going to discuss how orthogonal arrays not only help you plan test cases efficiently, give you high coverage, but also improve your data analysis. That's an extra step to say, how can I rapidly determine what caused my failure if I have a failure? And are there any questions from this exercise before we move on? Everyone wants to see what an OA is now? No. Let's go. All right. So I think with that, uh, we're going to step into what is an orthogonal array? What is, what is the baseline of the methodology? And then I'm going to show you how to actually construct orthogonal arrays for your testing problems. And we're going to learn a manual approach to do it. So someone who is inclined can go pick up a textbook and do it themselves. You don't, a tool makes it easier, but you don't need a tool. It's just a, hey, where you want to put, uh, prioritize your time. So let me give you a quick overview of the OA testing methodology. And for this, uh, let me take a quick example. And, uh, this is actually an example that we used with the, the US Navy um, to explain to them about orthogonal arrays. And I think it's a fitting example. I, I don't know. Uh, did, did, uh, do, do kids here in India have the Rubik's Cube toy? It's like this cube where you arrange the colors. OK, I had this toy when I was growing up. I know they banned it in the United States now. So when I explain it to uh, my niece, she has no idea what this toy is because there's some patent dispute. But uh, it looks like uh, it's still here. Um, so let's say you have a body of water. So you're, you're protecting, let's say, Mumbai port. Okay, You have a body of water that's the shape of a giant cube. And you're trying to protect it from enemy submarines. The body of water is your test domain. Think about that. That's your test scope. Enemy submarines are potential faults. Okay? And enemy submarines can enter through this cube and exit through this cube, any of these, any of these faces, and they go out. They could go in through the red side. They could go in through the blue side. They could go in through the yellow side. Total number of paths an enemy submarine can take are 54. So what do we do to protect our waters? We put mines. So you say, hey, if an enemy submarine goes through this water, we blow it up. We're, we're more peaceful. We say, OK, we detect it. We put a sensor there. Okay. So mines are expensive and sensors are expensive. Hey, how many do you need to protect this body of water? Same kind of question in testing. I want to pick the fewest test points that can detect all potential failure paths. So here's a question. How many, how, many, how many tests do you need? Anyone have a guess? There's 27 total cubes here. There are 54 paths, because they can go in this phase, out this phase. 54 paths. How many tests? Anybody? 20 mines? 10, 5, 1, no? Nobody? Okay. Okay. The answer is 9 mines. And that's based on an orthogonal array. And what an orthogonal array does for you is, if you look at the cube, it'll place test points, in this case mines, at very specific points within this cube. And if you look at any face of this cube, all points are covered. So if a submarine tries to enter from any direction, it'll be stopped. So what, what, what the lesson here is, when you think about a multi-dimensional space, and let's say this is now a, a, a test space, there's three dimensions. You could have, let's say this is a transaction you're running in a, in a store. You're testing a point of sale uh, software. So you, let's say this axis is your payment type. Someone can pay by payment, uh, by credit card, debit card, or by cash. Uh, let's say this axis is your uh, merchandise type. It could be a, a clothing, it could be an electronic, or it could be a uh, home appliance. And the reason that you're separating those is maybe there's different tax rates for those. I, I know where I live in, in the United States, there's different taxes. No, no tax on clothing, for example, and a reduced tax on home appliances. So the electronics get a high tax. And let's say um, this axis is transaction type. Someone could be purchasing something, someone could be returning something, 
Or someone could be buying a sale item, let's say. Let's call it a sale item. That's a, trans a, 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 a special deal. Let's call it a special deal. So three transaction types. So all combinations, if you look at that, are 27. So the same way, you can use the orthogonal array, pick nine transactions out of the total 27 that give you coverage over every direction that a user may go. Now this is a very simple problem. There's only three dimensions. We, we're, of course, talking about much more uh, challenging problems, but just, just an example for you. Any, any questions here before we move on? No? So let me give you a, a simplified view of how to generate an orthogonal array and also hey, how to lay out a test plan with it. Now this is an example from the US Army uh, for a weapons fire and detection system. Now this, is, this was a, a team that we worked with. They were developing a sensor uh, to de detect type and direction of enemy fire under several operating conditions. So let's say, and this was for urban environments, so Afghanistan and, uh, and Iraq type scenarios. So uh, you have a sensor in the field, and you may have enemies all over the place, and they're going to be firing their weapons at you. And this sensor has to, based on uh, different acoustic and, and, and light and sound that it's using, determine where the weapon is from and what type it is and how many there are. Now, we're going to simplify this problem, but I'm just giving you a little background about the problem. So in this case, let's say there's only a few factors, because we're going to give a simple example. It has to work in very low temperatures, because this may be used in an Arctic environment as well. Uh, just a median temperature and a high temperature. Number of weapons that an enemy, uh, in this case, could be, there could be only one weapon in the field, two weapons in the field, or five weapons in the field. Several different weapons types, and I picked these because they're very different. This is a very small munition, a larger munition, a huge munition. So just getting a whole span of the domain. And there's different mounting methods. It could be on a plane, it could be on a tripod that's on the ground, or you could attach it to your truck, let's say. So you look at it, you have four parameters, three levels each, all possibilities is 81. Now, these were actually being run in the field. There were soldiers running around using these to test them. So there was no way they could even afford to run 81. But uh, so let's assume that 81 was, was not an affordable, affordable number. Maybe in some other areas, if you're running a software test, maybe 81 you can run. Now, this you can test using an orthogonal array. Now, let me go over the properties of an orthogonal array. This is the L9 orthogonal array. It's, it's L stands for Latin square which are its origins. Nine stands for the number of tests. So if someone gives you an L27 orthogonal array, it has 27 tests. That, that's, that's just a common notation. Now, here are the properties of an orthogonal array. You go down any column, all combinations occur. So each column is associated with a factor. So in this case, this would be temperature, this would be number of weapons, this would be weapon type, and this is mounting method. So each column is associated with the parameter. Now, if you go down any of the columns, all combinations, so all values occur, and they occur an equal number of times. So if you go down the temperature, you have three at low temperature, three at middle temperature, three at that high temperature. Let's pick uh, column C, which was the weapons type. You get three at the first weapon type, two, uh, I mean three at the second weapon type, and three at the third weapon type. So the first thing you notice is there's a balance. All values are tested, and they're tested an equal number of times. So you get very uh, uniform coverage. But there's something more. Look at combinations of columns. Let's say column one and two. All combinations occur. So you get one, 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 two, one, three, two, one, two, 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 three, and three, one, three, two, three, three. All combinations occur, and they occur an equal number of times. So what does that mean? In this short test plan, you're assuring that not only you're covering all of the temperatures, but you're also covering all of the temperature and number of weapon combinations. If you look at columns two and three, again, and maybe take a minute yourselves and verify, all combinations occur. And they occur an equal number of times. So you're getting all coverage of the relationship between the number of weapons and the weapons type. 
And after that, hey, t look, take a look at column three and four. In fact, columns one and three, one and four, two and four, all columns. If you look at p any pair of columns, all combinations occur and they occur an equal number of times. So we'll detect not only all faults related to individual requirements, but we also detect faults related to interoperability of pairs of requirements. We're guaranteed to detect them in, in a short number of test cases. Now there's something more, uh, just on a mathematical basis. I, I'm sure uh, uh, most, of, uh, most of us have been out of math class for quite a while. So uh, uh, just bear with me for a minute. Uh, but there, there's something else. Re in reality, when, you, when I say all combinations occur and they occur an equal number of times, and there's a balance of levels, I'm saying that those columns are orthogonal with each other. That's the definition of orthogonal. And, and the real mathematical definition of orthogonal is, if you take the dot product of these two columns, it equals zero. Think about your orthogonal polynomial functions. You take the dot product, it equals zero. And, and let's just step through two of the columns. Um, I know there's you know, uh, quadratic terms, but let's leave those out for now. Let's just deal with the linear terms. And let me just show you. So for example, let's take columns one and two. And, and let's assume for this that value level one for column one is minus one. Okay? It just happens to be, let's say the temperature is minus one. Value two is zero. And value three is one. So we're going to have minus one three times, zero three times, and one three times. So let's just do that. So we take minus one, minus one, minus one, zero. Could we're just laying them out according to this table. And I'll just show you with two columns. This is, of course, true with all columns. Zero, zero, and then we have one. Uh, I have a blue pen. Let's see if that one works. Is it, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm blocking this when I'm standing here. Let me try this. See if you can see this better. Is this easier to see? OK. okay. So this is column one. There's a quadratic term. Let's leave that out. They're orthogonal as well. We, we, if, if somebody's really interested, we can talk about that later. Um, now let's take column two. Again, the first level is going to be minus one. Uh, second level is going to be uh, zero. And third level is going to be one. Just pick minus one to one range. That's, we're picking something simple for math. Okay, so this is minus one, zero, one. Okay. Zero, one. So let's say these are your two vectors. When you do a dot product, you're doing a dot product of two vectors. And I should have written these a little further apart, but you get the point. It's a dot product. So anybody want to come up and do the dot product? Anybody remember their math? No. <laughs> Put somebody on the spot? No, OK. So equals. So how you do a dot product is you just multiply the associated elements. So you multiply the first element with it. With it yeah, so minus 1 times minus 1. And you're going to take the sum of the, multi the product of each element. So minus 1 times minus 1 is 1. So sum of, let's say this is 1, uh, minus 1 and 0, 0. And if I make a mistake in math, someone please correct me. So this is, I'm sorry, this is a 1. Uh, minus one zero. This is a minus 1. And let's go through here. This is going to be 0, 0, 0. And then 1 times, this is minus 1. So 0, and this is a 1. So we take the sum of these numbers. So if you see, there's a 1 minus 1, so these cancel out. 1 minus 1, these cancel out. You get 0. That's, that means it's orthogonal. This is a test you can do. So if you guys know any statisticians in your companies, you want to wow them, go and take, to, take their array and say, I can do a dot product and show you that it's orthogonal or not. But that, this, this, is, this is the simple test you can do. And you could do this for any pair of columns going across. So th this is the real definition of orthogonality. Just wanted to uh, put that out there. So any questions with orthogonal array at, at this point? Yeah. Why, why was it, I'm going to get to that. How, 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 why was it an L9 array? I'll explain that later. We're going to actually decide because how to select it. in the printout, you have given something like 12. 
Yeah, that's a different orthogonal ray. There's, there's many orthogonal rays. So why would I pick 9 instead of 12 or instead of 27 or 50? Uh, that, that we're going to get to next. I, I just wanted to explain what are the properties of an orthogonal ray. Now once, in this case, hey, yes? Is there a limit to the size of an orthogonal ray? Yeah. Uh, we've generated orthogonal rays for like 250 parameters, each with 15 values each. So you can get to like thousands of, of values. Now the question there is, are all those parameters relevant to each other? That's, that's a, so it's a more engineering question. Yes, you can definitely generate the arrays. But hey, all those 250 parameters with 15 levels each, are they supposed to be tested together? Is it a meaningful response that you're going to measure out of it? These are, these are questions you should ask. But yes, you can, you can go as far as you want to go. What is the optimal number? The optimal number of the array? I, it depends on your problem. If you have a very simple, I mean, in this case, for four parameters, three levels each, L9 is the optimal. For, uh, let's say, 10 parameters, or 12 parameters, three levels each, hey, 27 is the optimal. That's just, you know that. The reason why I ask this question is you have a complex problem. You want to break it down into smaller problems and then use the optimal error for each of those, like L9 and R is possible? You can, of course, do that. But the question is, if they're supposed to be tested together, in this case, let's say I told you this. Take a simple example. OK. I'm just going to test an array with, we with temperature and number of weapons. I'm going to test a separate array with type of weapon and sensor mounting. What kind of assurance did I give my customer? He's looking for the temperature, number of weapons, type of weapon, and sensor mounting together. They're relevant parameters together. So when you break up your problem, it has to be a meaningful breakup. So let's say, for example, there was a separate one that dealt with uh, you know, the, the type of fuel you put in the vehicle uh, that you're mounting this to. It's not related to this. If it is related, we should include it. If it's, if it's not related, it, don't include it. So uh, yes, you should definitely break, break up a problem. If you have hundreds of parameters, chances are that there's really meaningful functions within there. Um, but you, you should, you, there, there's, of course, engineering thought process. You can't just go in dumb and, or, or blind and say, OK, I'm just going to throw everything into orthogonal array and my work is done. It, it should be, it, there, there's engineering insight you should put into it also. That's a very good question. Thanks. Could I have one question? Uh, yeah. It's a just basic question. How to identify the levels and factors? That's a, that's a very good question. That's, that's probably the hardest question here. So how, how do you identify the levels and factors? Uh, why don't we get to that a la little bit later in the discussion? But in this case, hey, the team knew that they, their requirement was they have to test for a temperature range of minus 50 to 160. That was, that was in the requirement for the system. And they picked a midpoint because they said they want to make sure performance is good at the midpoint as well. Uh, they also knew they had a range of number of weapons. So certain things are known because you can get them straight from your requirements document, either from your customers. You might have a requirements specification. If you don't, you may have an existing test plan for a prior release. So you know what test points they tested. You can, from that, you can easily pick out the factors and levels. Uh, like for a browser test, even if I didn't know the factors and levels, if I saw someone's test plan, I'd be able to say, OK, the operating systems are Windows NT, Windows ME, uh, Windows XP. So you can pick those things out. Now, one of the most important things to do is do a peer review of this with people that actually understand the system. Yeah, um, and, and I think this is one of the easiest ways to do a peer review. And we'll, we'll, we're, we're planning to get to that later, but I might as well bring it up here. Have any of you ever done a peer review of a requirements document or a technical document that's like this, this thick? Yeah, we do it all the time. How effective are our reviews? Some guy, usually what happens is somebody gives you a sticky note and says, you know, you forgot this test case or you forgot this requirement. They give some pet peeve of their past. Because there's no way you can digest such a large document. If you summarize your t parameters and levels, if the only thing you take out of this, this course is summarize my requirements as a factor table. You will tremendously improve the performance in your company. Tell everybody when they create a specifications document, write a factor table on top. So of course, write the details. But here's a summary of my requirements. And for each relevant function, do that. And get a peer review. And, you, uh, and there's an example later on of a, of a case in the telecommunications industry where peer review only took half a day for a huge system because we broke them down into factor tables. And people were able to give real insightful information. 
to add, yeah, choosing factors and levels is the hardest task out of, out of all of this. The rest of this is mathematics and mechanics. But that, that's your domain knowledge in your system, as well as the domain knowledge of your colleagues. Yeah, right. Uh, that's where the tester confused that how to identify the levels and factors. Sure. And we, we can discuss that later if you have any more questions on that. Kedar, I had a question. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, this slide says that you have 81 possible combinations. Yes. When you go to the next slide, we talk about 9. Yeah. So what happens to the rest of the 72? They could also have as many, as much uh, precedence or could be as serious uh, test cases as possible. Sure. Now sure. if you go to this line number 2, you know you have 1, 2, 2, 2. If I want to do 1, 2, 1, 2, I can't do that. Yeah, I do 1, 2, 3, 1. I don't do that. You're, you're right. We're so not running all combinations. We can't. So how do I factor that those combinations which I missed out, the 72, are not as important as these? I don't, I don't think it's a question of what's important. It's, it's the a other observation is that you're only comparing two columns at once. Sure. Whereas if you have to do three combinations at once, or sure. four. Absolutely. We'll, we'll discuss that later. But lim if you were doing three combinations at once, the minimum, the bare minimum you'd have to run is 27. So if you say, I want to run all three possibilities, at a minimum, now you're tripling your number of tests. But I'm so, missing that many more combinations. Some of this is a cost-risk trade-off. If you have the money, you have the budget, and there's a risk, hey, test everything. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if you guys have, but if your team has budget to run all combinations, that's fantastic. I don't know any company that, that does, but I'd, I'd love to work for your company. <laughs> But you, you, have to make, you, have to make, you have to make intelligent, you have to say, how can I pick? There's, there's no way we can run all combinations. You, you agree with that, right? Yeah. So we're going to have to make, we're going to have to make trade-offs. Now, we're making trade-offs in an intelligent way. We're saying, how can we pick a small number of tests to maximize coverage within those tests? Yes, there's a possibility that there's some four-way combination we're missing. But if we were to hit all four-way combinations, we'd have to run all 81. And there's no way, we learned in the browser test example, you can't run all combinations. But we can, we can pick points intelligently. And I'll tell you, um, in comparisons, and, and I'll go through that later, in the financial services industry, they actually ran side-by-side -side cases. And we did this with 20 firms. Um, and ran side-by-side -side cases where they ran their traditional process versus orthogonal array. And every time they found either all the defects in the original test case or more. So yes, in an ideal world, if time was not a factor, if money was not a factor, we'd run everything. But the challenge you should look at is not how can I go to ideal, but how can I do better than I am today? So let's run faster than we're running today. Maybe in the future we'll be able to run like bullets. But let's take what knowledge, domain knowledge we have today, apply some intelligent math, and come up with test cases that hey, get us there uh, I have a question here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. How is DOE different from this? DOE? Yeah. Well, this. DOE is, there, there's several differences. The first is it's, it's, it deals with statistical modeling. The objective is to build a model. We're not building a model here. We're testing. So is it enough to do one of them, or we have to do both of them in parallel? You know? DOE? Yeah. Well, traditionally, DOE is applied at the design stage. So when you're deciding, so for example, let's say we were making a decision. This is not the case. Uh, but let's say for this problem, we were making a decision. Uh, this, uh, it's not a realistic problem. Let's say we were deciding what operating temperature run at. Maybe we could put this in a temperature chamber okay, and run it and say, OK, where does it give the most accurate reading? Then you would use DOE to say, which one of these should I choose as my set point in a design? DOE is to choose your, you build statistical models to choose your set point in designs. This, this is dealing with, given a design, or given a system, or given a software, evaluate its functionality, or evaluate how well it performs for your response criteria. The, if you were running a DOE here, you'd have to run several replicates of this uh, just to get the statistical confidence level. I mean, you've already blown your budget. But yes, a good, good question. But it's DOE is for a different phase in the development. We're talking about testing. Yeah, good. Go ahead. Yeah, so the question is, you know, the earlier one they said, right? So if you test 81 test cases and if you do 9 test cases, so what is the risk? So how much of defects which you may not detect is, is probably the thought, right? So if I do 9 versus 81, what's the percentage? Is it, 
you're going to cover like 80 percent is it the defects will come in what's the research well, on l let me ask you a question do you run all combinations today no we no, don't. No, 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 I'm, ju I'm just saying, do you run all combinations? Uh, no, today? I'm just and saying. And do you find do you find a majority of the defects? No, I'm saying you're, you're just statistical, right? And that's why I'm saying, what is the percentage of confidence here? If I do test 9 instead of 81, is it how, well, how confident are you? Mathematically, it's 9 over 81, 1 ninth. If, if you're saying that every single place has a test point, we don't know where it is, yeah. 1 ninth. But what we're doing is we're planning these test cases intelligently. And, and this, this is something that um, deals with orthogonality. You're uniformly distributing your test cases. So you have a very high likelihood of finding defects. Yes, of course there's a possibility you're going to miss something, but we were going to miss it anyway. There's no way we could have run it. I, th I, I think the comparison you have to make is what am I doing today to what I can do? It, it, and statistically, yes, it's, if, if you're looking at 81 and saying there's a, there's a fault at every single point, and we only run nine, we're going to miss. Uh, and, they're, and they're unique faults. So you're saying they're four-level faults. So they deal with four-level combinations. Now, how many faults are four-level combinations? That's, that's another thing you think of. I'll tell you, if you run this on this type of problem, you will find all your defects. Do it through experience. Try it out. We've done it on several side-by-side -side cases. Now, of course, there's one, once in a while you, you miss a defect, and you have to use your engineering knowledge. But we miss defects anyway. The fact is we want to be more efficient, and we want to find more defects than we used to before. So once you've selected an orthogonal array, uh, you just lay out your test cases according to the orthogonal array. So for example, where there was a 1, you put, these, uh, put the low temperature. Uh, where there's a 2, you put the mid temperature. Where there's a 3, you put the high temperature. And as you read along each row, that's your test case. So you have nine test cases according to the orthogonal array. So you're bound to trigger one of them because you're using a uniform, you're setting test points across this whole domain. You're bound to trigger. Maybe you might not get the test point here, but you'll find the defect over here. So that's how you get your coverage. Now, these type of isolated faults, I, I call those, you know, typo faults. Someone may have typed in a wrong number. So say, okay, instead of uh, you know, just a, a wrong number. Now, th there's, di there's different methods that are really good. Let's say you have a database, you have their CRC sum, check sum type things you can use for checking databases if someone wrote a wrong number. But if you're dealing with logic faults, which is what we're dealing with in engineering systems, then you're, you're bound to detect it. Okay. And with that, I think we'll take a, take a five minute break, just a stretch break. Please keep it at five minutes, and then we'll come back, regroup. And if anyone has questions, they can come up here as well. Yeah, please, five minutes. Okay. So uh, in the earlier chapter, I showed you L9 for that problem. Now, uh, someone had an excellent question, said, why L9? And uh, now I'm going to step through that. I'm going to step through how to manually generate and select orthogonal rays. So given a problem, how do you decide what orthogonal array is appropriate for it? So here are a few just basics uh, to know. When determining what orthogonal array is correct, the first thing is, hey, define your requirements. Hey, what are you testing? What's your scope? What are, how many factors do you have? How many levels for each factor? And how many available resources? There may be some very stringent resource constraints that cause you, then you may have to cut down the factors and levels. But, and also, just to note, there, there's a special notation that's used in uh, statistical books, and we're going to be using it here. Um, let's say someone writes 2 to the fifth, or if you see 2 to the fifth, that signifies five two-level factors. Just a shorthand for saying five two-level factors. And one of the nice things is if you actually evaluate this, it's the value of all combinations for five two-level factors. So two to the fifth, three to the fourth, five two-level factors, four three-level factors. Just a shorthand notation for combinations of factors and levels. To give you a little historical background on orthogonal arrays, um, they started a very long time ago. Um, and uh, they've been used throughout the ages by uh, the ancient Greeks 
and uh, they became more popular with Euler. And he took Latin squares, which are the origins of Latin uh, orthogonal arrays, and used them to develop war games. Uh, so he wanted to determine what warrior formations were ideal for battle. And if you think about it, there's millions of possible formations. You could have a man on a horse standing in front of the line. You could have him holding a gun or a sword or a staff. The, you could have two men, ten men, a chariot. There are many different possibilities of soldier configurations. So he said, hey, let me use these Latin squares to come up with a short set of experiments to determine what the best soldier configuration is. So, that, so he, he greatly popularized them. Uh, the mathematical foundations and uh, people, by the way, get their PhDs uh, in generating orthogonal arrays. Uh, and they, they spend years creating an orthogonal array. So that list of standard orthogonal arrays that I handed out to everybody, someone actually made, like, created those. And, and there's uh, several different ways. One is linear algebra, Galois field theory, complex number theory, and surprisingly, trial and error. Some people have just put together these numbers and, and generated arrays. Um, there's several different famous mathematicians that have generated orthogonal arrays, and actually my father, uh, Madhu Farke, uh, was the one who, at at t Bell Laboratories, who started using orthogonal arrays for testing. So here's a table of standard orthogonal arrays, and everybody ha in their handout has this as well. And here's how you read this table. On the leftmost column, it lists the orthogonal array going all the way down. So you start from L4 to L81. L stands for Latin squares. That's in uh, paying homage to the origins of Latin squares. 4 stands for the number of tests. So, or, or number of rows, let's, let's be more uh, mathematical here, number of rows. So L4 has 4 rows. L8 has 8 rows. L81 has 81 rows. And each of these rows will correspond to a test case. If you assign this, uh, your problem to that array, that's how many test cases you'll get. Number of columns is how many factors fit into that orthogonal array. So L4 can fit three factors. L81 can fit 40 factors. And there are specific column levels within each orthogonal array. So for example, L4 can fit three factors, all of them with two values each. So that would be something if you had a f uh, three factors where their values were on and off, or one and zero, or high and low. L4 will give you four tests or orthogonal array. L27 has 13 factors, 27 tests, the number of rows is 27, and it takes all 13 of those factors are three levels. So if you had 13 factors with three values each, L27 is what you choose. And so th this is how you read the table. And let's go through a few exercises just to kind of get our practice. So here are the steps in OA selection. I give you a table of standard orthogonal arrays, and here's the mathematical way in which you select your orthogonal array. Step one, calculate the minimum number of tests. Okay? So you don't want to have to search this entire table to find out which orthogonal array fits your problem. You want to get a starting point. So let's say your minimum number of tests is 18. You start searching after this point, for example. Or your minimum number of tests is 50. You start to, to, uh, searching after this point. And here's how you calculate minimum number of tests. By the way, uh, I, afterwards, if you send me an email, I can send you all these slides also. So you guys can get a copy of, of all the information. You can, you can write it all down as well, but I can give you the slides. Uh, so there's two parameters in calculating the minimum number of tests. The fir and the minimum number of tests is the larger of those two parameters. And the two parameters are degrees of freedom. This is a statistical term. And the product of the two largest factors. Now degrees of freedom, if you read a statistics book, and you're not a mathematician, it's pretty challenging to understand what, what it really means. But it's actually very simple. This is how you calculate degrees of freedom. And if you want to wow your friends or any statistical friends, this is, this is how you do it. One degree of freedom for the baseline. Any problem has one degree of freedom at a minimum. Okay? You have to run one test. One degree of freedom. 
for every two-level factor, one additional degree of freedom. So if you have two two-level factors, that's two degrees of freedom, plus the baseline, that's three total degrees of freedom. Okay? For every two degrees of freedom, for every three-level factor, three degrees of freedom for every four-level factor. So for a 10-level factor, nine degrees of freedom. Just take the number of levels minus one, that's your degrees of freedom for that factor. And you just sum them up, add the one for the baseline, that's your total degrees of freedom. That's your minimum. So for that w weapons fire detection system, we had four three-level parameters. So we have one degree of freedom for the baseline, plus two degrees of freedom for each parameter times four. So we get nine, nine degrees of freedom. So that's one parameter for setting the minimum number of tests, degrees of freedom. And, and we'll go through a few exercises so everyone's comfortable with calculating degrees of freedom. The second is the product of the two largest factors. So out of your problem, pick the two factors that have the largest number of levels. In this case, they all, all four of them have three levels, so just pick two of them. And take the product of them. So three times three is nine. So in this case, Degrees of freedom is 9, product of two largest factors is 9, so your test minimum starts at 9. Your search starts at 9. Doesn't mean you have 9 tests, it means that's your minimum. Now, for example, let's say degrees of freedom was 8, hypothetically, and product of two largest factors was 9, you have to start at 9. That's your minimum. So the larger of the two is your minimum number of tests. So for the WFDS problem, we, we have 9 as the minimum, so let's go back to this table and let's see how do we select an orthogonal array for this problem. So first thing we know is we start at 9. And we know we have four factors, and guess what? L9 happens to fit four factors. And we go down, and we notice that all four factors can be three levels. So L9 works. Let's say, for example, this was over here. It didn't allow, it, it allowed two levels, just say hypothetically. Hey, L9 would not be an appropriate array. It's because it allows four factors, and all of those factors have three levels. So that problem fits the L9 orthogonal array. And that's how you search this table. So step one, calculate your minimum number of tests. And that is the maximum of the degrees of freedom and the product of the two largest factors. Step two is then you search through a standard set of a library of orthogonal arrays. You can get them from any textbook, go buy, buy a statistics textbook hundreds of these in there. Uh, you can find some online, you know, they're, they're available. And find out which is the appropriate orthogonal array and lay out your problem. So let, let's go through a few exercises. Seven two-level factors, that's your problem. Okay, exhaustive tests, 128. So what's the minimum? Calculate degrees of freedom. How do we calculate degrees of freedom? Any, anybody have a guess on how many degrees of freedom? One for each, I heard that. Plus what? Plus one. So you get seven, one for each factor, plus one, eight. Okay. And what's the product of the two largest factors? Four, okay. So what's the minimum number of tests? No, no, no. Minimum is the max of the two. Eight. So minimum is eight. So we cannot fit an orthogonal array smaller than eight for this problem. So let's go search through the table. Okay. So we start at eight, and we had seven factors, two levels each. Now, guys, I picked easy ones right now. We'll get to harder ones later. All right? And it just happens to be all seven factors are two levels each. So this is an appropriate array for that problem. So we get that, and you choose the L8 orthogonal array. So you have eight test cases to test that problem. And that's a good, great efficiency gain, 128 down to 8. And here's the L8 orthogonal array. So you'd select this orthogonal array and lay out your test cases. So your, let's say, your first level, um, would, go, uh, first level would go here. Second level for your, first uh, for your first factor would go here. Laid out according to this orthogonal array. These are your eight test cases. Now let's take a, a little bit more challenging problem. Now, not all problems only have two levels. They have mixed number of levels. So let's take this problem. We have one two-level factor, 
and six three-level factors. How many degrees of freedom? Anyone? 14? Yeah. How did, how did we come up with that? Let's see. You have one for the baseline, one for the two level, that's two, and two for each of the three levels. So plus 12. So 14. Okay. I'm sorry? You always add one. Always add one to any calculation of degrees of freedom because there's one for the baseline. You always have to run one test. So once you, once you sum it up for all of your factors, always add one as the baseline. So it's 14 degrees of freedom. What is the product of the two largest factors? Anyone? Nine. OK, nine. Because the two largest factors, you take, take two of these three levels. Three times three is nine. So what's the minimum? 14. OK, that's good. Okay. So what array should we select? Let's go back to our standard table. Okay. So there's no 14, but OK, anything above this line is not acceptable to us. How about L16? It takes 15 factors. And all 15 have to be two levels. Will that work for us? No. OK. So we go on to the next one, L16 prime. By the way, in, in the standard orthogonal arrays, you'll see there's a lot of primes, which are variations of, of the existing arrays. So there, there's many modifications you can make to these arrays. Uh, in this case, it has five parameters. And in, our, in this case, we have seven parameters. So no good. We go to L18. OK, has enough, has, has eight, eight columns. We have seven parameters, so I think maybe we have enough capacity. One of them is a two level. Seven of them are a three level. So is this the right array for us? But wait a second. There's seven. We only have six of these. Is that OK? Run two more tests? If you to, no, no. You added maybe an extra parameter. Okay? But in, you don't have to. L18 is the right array. Let's go back here. And here's a new rule. Dropping a column does not lose orthogonality. Look, we're looking at orthogonality between columns. So if you leave out a column, it doesn't matter. You don't have to add a parameter if you don't have one. You can always drop columns. So in this table, if we go back to this table, let me. Yes. If you go back to this table, let's say, for example, you had six two-level parameters. You could fit in L8. You don't lose orthogonality. You could have five two-level parameters fitted in here. Drop two columns. You don't lose orthogonality. What it does mean is there's an opportunity, to free, a freebie, to test more parameters. If there are more parameters you're leaving out, you can add them and not increase the size of your test plan. But it, you don't lose orthogonality. So you can always drop a column. Let's go back here. Oh. However, dropping a row loses orthogonality. So you can't say, you know, instead of an L8, I'm going to drop a row and call it an L7. If you do that, not orthogonal. And if you ever feel like doing it, take a look at this dot product. Imagine I deleted one of these rows. It wouldn't equal 0. It's a way to think about it. This, uh, the, the dot product would not equal 0, which means not orthogonal. So you can always drop columns. You cannot drop rows. Now, now here's a new question. This is, this is a new technique called the dummy level technique. And let's look at this problem. You have one two-level factor, three three-level factors. So what's the minimum number of tests? Who, who, someone tell me. They cal calculate degrees of freedom. Eight. OK, eight. Okay. And what are the product of the two largest levels? Nine. I heard nine. OK. So what's the minimum number of tests? Nine. 
go back here. So we go back to our table and we say we can start at 9. It has four factors, but all four of them are three levels. We have one two-level parameter. So what's our, what's our next search? We look down, we keep going down to, for something that has three levels. We see L18, okay? We have one two-level and three three-levels. And we leave four columns blank. Well, that's a lot of test cases for such a small problem. So this is something where you can use something called a dummy level technique. There's a way you can fit. So this is a rule. You can fit a factor with a small number of levels in a column with a larger number of levels. So you can fit a factor with two levels in a three level column. And in doing so, you can narrow it down to nine tests. And I'll show you how. And it's called assigning a dummy level. And here's how it works. So we have one two-level parameter and three three-level parameters. Three three-level parameters, everyone knows, hey, you just lay it out according to the orthogonal array, that's your level. The two-level parameter, for the third level, you choose one of the other levels. And the most important thing is, is you choose it consistently. Don't say, OK, sometimes I'm going to choose A1, sometimes I'm going to choose A2 you will not retain orthogonality. If you choose the dummy level consistently, you retain orthogonality. And if somebody wants to come offline, I'll show you. You can do a dot product equals 0. It's good to go. So, and you can have, for example, with, with dummy levels, you can fit a smaller level factor into an unlimited number, of, large number of columns. So for example, you could fit a two level factor in a nine level column if you wanted to. You just have seven dummy levels, which means you can choose one or many of those parameters and fit them as dummy levels. You can always fit a factor with a smaller number of levels in a column with more factors. And this is a technique to get to a smaller. Instead of going to an L18, we're able to half it and go to an L9. And what are some considerations in selecting a dummy level if it happens? Hey, you may want to choose the parameter that's the cheapest to test. You're running extra tests with it. You don't want to increase your cost. Or you may choose a parameter that you want to have the most information about. So let's say A1 happens to be something that's new in your new release. Hey, this way you, you're automatically getting extra tests for A1. So you can use those type of considerations. Or you may choose something that's easy. I, I know in uh, being a tester, I used to always want to do whatever the easiest path was. I didn't want to make changes in my test plan. So maybe in this case, you may say, I'll just choose A2. I don't want to have to bother changing another knob. So, so there, there's many ways in which you can choose a dummy level, and it depends on hey, what your priorities are as a, as a test organization. And I'm just going to say that. Okay, so just a few exercises to, to get comfortable with uh, uh, selecting orthogonal arrays. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to give you a list of problems. And just on your own, with pen and paper, you have your table right in front of you. Um, calculate degrees of freedom. Calculate the the a product of the two largest factors and select the candidate orthogonal array. And here are the problems. And everybody just take a few minutes and go through each of these and solve them. always one degree of freedom for the baseline. If you had one parameter, one level, you still have one degree of freedom. Otherwise, no test. One degree of freedom. For every two-level factor, add one additional degree of freedom. For every three-level factor, add two degrees of freedom. For every four-level factor, three degrees of freedom. Just number of levels minus one. That's the degrees of freedom that that factor contributes. OK, number one, uh, how many degrees of freedom? 11. Is everyone in agreement about 11? Okay. Uh, what's the product of the two largest levels? 
four, okay. And what array? L12? Everyone in agreement? Okay, good. Uh, number two, five three level factors. How many degrees of freedom? 11, okay, so same degrees of freedom as the earlier problem. Uh, product of two largest levels? I'm sorry? Nine, okay. And what orthogonal array? 18, L18. Uh, number three, eight three level factors. How many degrees of freedom? 17? Everyone in agreement? Okay. What are the product of the two largest number of levels? Nine, okay. And what array? 27, L27, very good. Okay. Let's do uh, number six. Okay, number six, how many degrees of freedom? If people haven't gotten there yet, just do number six real quick. We don't have to go through all of them, yeah. Seventeen, okay. And how do we calculate that? We have one five level that contributes four degrees of freedom. And, and we, it, we have six times two, because each three level. So we get sixteen plus one for the baseline, seventeen. What's the product of the two largest levels? 15, okay, and what array? 25, does 25 work? Let's go and check. Okay, L25 allows six parameters. How many parameters do we have here? We have seven parameters. So L25 is no good. L50? OK, L50 is a choice. Everyone agree? L50? What, what about that uh, dummy level technique? L50 it is, very good. Yeah, later on, what I'll, I'll show you, uh, and, and there, there's ways to actually go even smaller. You can fit it into an L18 modified, uh, but that we can discuss uh, uh, at, a, at a later time. You can combine columns together. That's, a, that's another technique you can use, uh, different higher level factors, but L50 based on, based on the table you have. All right, so does everyone have a pretty good idea of how to select an orthogonal array? Again, just to review, I know it's a little redundant. First thing is, you want to determine the minimum number of tests. Two things to do that. You want to pick the larger of the product of the largest number of levels and the degrees of freedom. Okay. And somebody want to volunteer, how do you calculate degrees of freedom? Anybody? No? Okay. One for the baseline and one for every two level parameter two for every three level parameter, three for every four level parameter, the number of levels minus one. Sum those up, that's the total degrees of freedom. That's your minimum number of tests. And using that, then you use the standard orthogonal race to generate your orthogonal race. Now here's a question. What orthogonal race should we select for our browser test problem? For browser tests, we have three three levels, four two levels, and one nine level. Yeah, we one nine level. So how many degrees of freedom? Twenty-four. 
24 degrees of freedom? Plus 1. 19. Plus 1. Right? 1 for the baseline. Is it? I may, I may be wrong also. Let me check. Does everyone see how it's 19 degrees of freedom? You have one 9 level that contributes 8 degrees of freedom. You have three 3 levels that contributes 6 degrees of freedom. You have four 2 levels that contributes 4. So you have 18 there, plus 1 for the baseline, 19. So you have 19 degrees of freedom. What is the product of the two largest factors? In this case, you have a one, you have a nine level. That's your largest factor, and then you, the next largest is a three level, so twenty-seven. Yeah. And uh, what array do you select? Yeah, it's a trick question. <laughs> Is not there. So these, these are special arrays that are generated. They're not standard orthogonal arrays. They're generated. So in the case of when you deal with unique problems, someone was asking earlier, um, how, how do you, uh, like, or is there a specific optimal orthogonal array for all problems? No, that's not the case. It's generated for the specific problem. There's, of course, a list of standards which are used and combined together to create these uh, specific orthogonal arrays. And that's a much more advanced topic than, than a four-hour lecture. Um, but uh, in, in this case, actually, it came to 27 test cases in L27. So there's a modification to L27 that fit the problem in. So you could get to the, you could equal the minimum. And we'll, we'll discuss how, how, we'll discuss some problems on how that's done later. And ju just to give, uh, so here's, here's the factor table, by the way, for browser test. And just as an exercise, I know a lot of people don't have, have the software, but uh, the RDX Express software was used to generate those L, the L27 for browser test. And this is just a simple example um, of how you can generate orthogonal arrays using, using a tool. And anybody that wants to download it, you're free to download it. There's a website uh, that uh, PMI organization sent you. Uh, this, is, this is a tool, by the way, that my company uh, created for generating orthogonal arrays. So you just type in your problem, and it gives you an orthogonal array. And I'll just, I'll step through this one. We could always look at them later, but uh, j just to give you a simple example of, of how it works. And someone had asked earlier about negative tests. Uh, this is a case where we're testing negative and positive tests in the same test plan. Uh, this was for an ATM, a cash machine, at a, at a bank. And of course, simplified from the real steps, but uh, good illustration. You have an initial balance. Initial balance. Um, Generally, the minimum they say for initial balance before they start charging fees is $100. You could have the average uh, deposits that this bank had was $1,000 for a checking account. And uh, they considered a high balance, anything $10,000 or above. So these were the three classifications of initial balance. Withdrawal amount could be $10, a really low withdrawal, usually the minimum withdrawal in a machine. $100 withdrawal and a $500 withdrawal. $500 was considered the daily limit, so that was a special logic point. The reason they're choosing these are Hey, they could have, of course, picked 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, but hey, they're picking ones based on real logic points. It's equivalence classes. So going back to factor level selection, technically, the withdrawal amount could be anything from 10 to 500. Now, why did they select these is for specific reasons. 10 is the minimum you could withdraw. 100 was the average withdrawal. And 500 is the daily limit. So each of them triggers a different logic point, which, which is why they selected these. Uh, receipt requested, yes, no. And session exit, you could either you know, just walk away from your machine, leave the card in there, and it'll time out and eat your card uh, to make sure no one can steal money from you. Or yeah, you select the option to exit and exit out, uh, cancel out properly. So here we're actually testing one negative test. For example, you have an initial balance of 100, and you try to withdraw 500. So you can include negative and positive tests to make sure that you get the right error messages. And it all depends on the system that you're trying to use. And, and let me just quickly uh, show you how you would input this into RD Expert uh, to generate an orthogonal array. Yeah.
launch. It, anybody who has the software can follow along, and others, we can always download it. And you just create a new project and save it. And this is very different than any stat statistical tool you'll use. You don't need to know any statistics to use it. All you do is enter in your problem, and that's it. And it'll generate the orthogonality for you. So whatever your problem may be, if you have a, your browser test with nine levels, you could have something. If there's more operating systems, you have 15 operating systems, enter all 15. It just generates it for you. It creates unique orthogonalities for your problem. So in this case, we have an initial balance. It had three possible levels. And they were 100, 1,000, and 10,000. Uh, next one is withdrawal amount. It had three levels, and it was $10, $100, and $500. Oh, sorry. Uh, receipt requested. is two levels. It's yes or no. And of course, if you had additional parameters, you could add those as well. And session exit, there's two values, which is and. OK, so you could select option to exit or select session timeout. And you just enter in your parameters. By the way, you can add dependencies if there's dependencies between these parameters, relationships. And you just click on display log. It automatically generates your orthogonality for you, including dummy level selection, any column adjustments, and, and that's it. And uh, so, so that's just a, a, a quick example. Let's see here. I think we have a few minutes before break. OK, are there any questions on? Um, manually constructing uh, orthogonal arrays. Yeah. Sure, sure. Sorry, I went too fast. Apologize. Now, what I'm going to do in the upcoming units, uh, the next unit, now, now that we've talked about kind of the methodology of how to generate these orthogonal arrays, I'm going to now get into applications. And we're going to look at uh, applications from various industries at different points in the life cycle. So uh, some of them very early in the life cycle at the requirement stage, some of them later in the life cycle at the, you know, the, the demonstration or, or test demonstration stage. Uh, the first example I'm going to show you is actually from uh, the uh, defense industry uh, for an electronic warfare system. And uh, are, are you finished? Or? Almost. Okay. Yeah. yeah sorry. The second example after the defense example is uh, enterprise mortgage uh, system test. And that was a huge end-to-end uh, -end test uh, integrating all the steps in a, uh, in a mortgage bank, from loan application uh, to payment acceptance, uh, credit verification, um, reporting, user portals, everything, integrating them into a single uh, integrated platform. Um, so so I'll, walk th I'll walk through that one as well. We, ha we have about 10 minutes before we're breaking for lunch. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll go through part of this, and then we can, we can complete it uh, later on. Uh, by the way, this was done at ITT Avionics. And let me kind of explain to you what an EW system is. Uh, anybody here a pilot, Air Force pilot, or worked in the Air Force? No? OK. Well, flying a plane is very different than before. It's not that you see an enemy in the sky and he shoots at you. It's more a game of. Electronics. Almost, you can almost look at this as an antivirus. A plane flies over land, and there's going to be radars trying to detect it. Some of those radars are friendly. Some of them are threats. 
Now this plane has a EW, it has a receiver, has to decide very quickly whether that radar is a friend or a foe and take action based on those, uh, on, on its decision. And if it takes action too late, it'll be shot down. So they may say, okay, it's a friend, tell him where I am. Or they may say it's a foe, jam that radar, block him. I don't want him to know where I am. And it's, a, it's analogous to an antivirus. When you, when you download a file or when you're surfing the web, the antivirus software is constantly searching whether this is a friendly file or an unfriendly file. If it's an unfriendly file, it immediately tries to block the execution of it. If it's a friendly file, it says, okay, accept it and let it go through. So it's very similar to antivirus for an airplane. And just like antivirus for our systems, this is mission critical. Uh, in a way, if our computers get a virus, it's a life or death scenario. Same thing in these planes, it's an actual life or death scenario. So here was the background. The government had determined there were a hundred possible radar types. And, and you see this with customers all the time. Your customer will tell you, hey, there's X number of possible scenarios that you have to validate your system against. In this case, they said there was 100 possible radar types in which, or emitter types, which is combinations of signal strength, uh, pulse width, uh, different types of you know, agile or, 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 or static uh, um, you know, signals. So, so many different characteristics. So there are 100 different sets of characteristics that you had to detect against. And the government felt that was a good enough test. If, if it passed those 100, hey, they could fly their planes around the world and be OK. Now, when it's the same thing, think of analogous in the software world, antivirus. Let's say your customer says, hey, these are 100 different possible viruses. I want to make sure you can detect all of them. But here's the question, that, and this is the big challenge they had. If your customer says they're validating 100, so you know, you, 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 have, you have the blessing of knowing exactly how they're going to validate you, and you're still developing your system, do you need to test with those 100 every release? Well, these guys were. And running 100 emitter tests took 16 hours of their equipment. And they were running weekly releases. So if you're running weekly, weekly releases and there's 16 hours of testing, that means two days of no development. It's a huge strain on development. They had to, get their, they had to pay overtime to get their engineers to come in on the weekend just to meet deadlines. Now, monthly, they were demonstrating this to the customer. And when the customer wanted to see the 100, without a doubt. But what they thought is, hey, is there a way we can cut down our regression tests on a weekly basis? And in fact, using orthogonal array, they were able to cut it down to 18 tests. So 75% reduction on a weekly basis. They were able to detect all defects found by the 100 in those 18 tests. And they were able to increase debugging capability. Now I'm going to walk you through. This is just kind of a summary. So here was a testing process they followed. This is a very generic testing process. I think it's just a, a, a good rule of thumb to follow. Hey, define the function of the system under test. You should know what you're testing. If you don't know anything about what you're testing, you, you have no business testing. You should know something about it, at least the inputs, outputs, if it's a black box, something like that. Define the operating domain of test parameters. So OK, what are, you, what are your different uh, controllable factors, non-controllable factors that you need to validate against? So basically, de define what your factors and levels are and create a factor table. Get a peer review of that factor table. Make sure you're complete. This is very important, and it's, and it's a very quick process once you develop a factor table. Someone will say, you know what? This is a useless parameter. We threw that out years ago. Or, hey, you forgot this. You forgot this level. They can tell you very quickly. Select an orthogonal array based on uh, the, the factor table to create a test plan. Uh, generate test procedures and expected results. This is a challenging step, but that has to be done. Execute the test and analyze results. Very generic process, but I think it just lays out the, the way the team worked on this. So here was their factor table. They had frequency diversity, two types of frequency diversity. They had uh, a range of frequency. Of course, I have to hide these parameters. I can't give you the real numbers. Uh, but there is a high, mid, and a low. Uh, PRI type, there were three different types, CW, stable, and agile, and so forth. Uh, peak power, there was a range of peak power, and illumination. So this was the operating domain they selected. And based on these, the government had given 100 uh, different emitters 
uh, to operate on. If you look at all combinations, say we're talking about way more than 100, but the government selected a set of 100. So using the factor table, they generate an orthogonal array. And this was an L18 orthogonal array, 18 tests. So they said 18 tests versus the 100. Now this team was scared. They said, how can I cut my test to 18? I'm supposed to run 100, and I'll look like a fool if I go in front of the government. And they've already told me they're testing me on this 100 if I fail. They, they, were, they, were, they, were, very, they were very scared about it. So for the first test cycle, they ran the 100 and the 18 to get confidence, because this was a very critical system. And the way, the way the contracts worked here, if you didn't pass your test, you didn't get paid. So they had to eat the budget. So they said, we want to pass our test. So for the first two weeks of releases, they ran the 18 tests, and they ran the 100. And they compared the defects they found. And lo and behold, every defect, unique defect they found from the 100, they found with the 18. So what did that mean? They could confidently reduce to a lower set and get high assurance that when they actually run the 100, they'll pass. So again, they ran the tests. They identified defects. Now's the next challenge. And this is one of the tremendous benefits of an orthogonal array versus using uh, a manual test planning method. The balancing properties, when I, I, was, I was stressing much earlier, I was saying each factor, each level is tested an equal number of times. Each, each combination is tested an equal number of times, those type of things, what they relate to is your orthogonal array is balanced. And what that allows you to do is very quickly get to what are the root cause of defects. And I think we hit the time, so we can uh, uh, pick this up uh, after, after lunch. Any, any questions? I think we have two minutes left. Does OA promises less number of test sets always? Does OA promise the least number of test sets compared to what? Let's see, what do you, what are you compare to? the manual to? ones. No, I, I, could, I could have picked five manual test cases. No, I mean, see, basically it is, it is a question of the, the, the coverage here, right? How, how, how many number of uh, test coverage you do with the orth orthogonal array, right? Sure, sure. It's not the number of, less number of test cases always. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. In some cases, and, and there are cases I'm going to go through later, where an OA selects more test cases yep. because the, te the initial testing was so inadequate for the factors and levels that you get more test cases. So you're absolutely right. Good question. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I thought you meant you're just comparing versus any random manual test case. No. Okay, got it. Sorry about that. Yeah. Can I add there? Yeah, sure. Yeah. See, whatever the question you asked, no? with respect to manual testing, if you have written the factors and levels, it is always factors to the power of level. Okay. That means if you have got two factors and four levels, 2 to the power of 4 is how much? 16. When you go and look at the manual testing, how we do it is based on our knowledge, based on our experience with respect to domain, we go and write the test cases. Okay. So we did a, in our organization, we have done it. We gave those to write the test cases. Each and every individual has written 8 test cases, 12 test cases, 13 test cases. 16 test cases, okay? So, but OA takes the combination of all these things and comes out with eight test cases. That is the thing. So it, it doesn't depend upon the individual person. It depends upon mainly when you go to the manual testing, no? It depends upon the individual person, what is his understanding of the system, and he goes and writes the test cases based on that. But actually, if a person who knows in depth about the manual testing, what he will do is, to the power of 4, you will write, you will write correctly 16 test cases. But when you come to the OA, automatically it does an amazing work and gives you 8 test cases or depends upon yeah. the whatever the tool we are using it, no? I, I think a lot of times one thing to add to that also is not even, sometimes it's lack of knowledge of a system that causes the inadequate testing. Sometimes it's just uh, a budget not aligned with the actual problem. Where some uh, manager will say, you have two weeks to test this system, that's it. No questions asked, and it's a huge system. So you're limited by something that's not correlated with the actual problem. So that's where, why you end up. So it may not be the tester's fault, it's just that that's the scenario, that's a reality of life. But, but there, so there maybe sometimes, hey, OA will give you more, but now you know, okay, what's your risk trade-off? 
and, and you, can do, you can do those in a more uh, systematic basis. Good, Good thank you. Any questions? Uh